Hi everybody, I'm Adam Booth, and I'm joining Katie and Otto Ross today as we bring you a program of Stories for the Season. Thanks for joining us and Mountain City Traditional Arts as we explore the storytelling traditions of the region. So, here are Katie and Otto. Now the first story that I'm about to tell you comes from Austria and it's called The Forest Bear. And I'm going to have my husband Otto Ross play the accordion, a polka, just to get us in the mood. Okay, Otto. <laughs> His real name was Blasi Pear, <laughs> but everybody in that small Austrian village called him the Forest Bear. Why? Well, he was a giant of a man, and he had this bushy beard, and his hair just seemed to go everywhere, so he looked a little bit like a bear. And he lived in Steiger Forest, in a small cottage nestled into the woods. He was a carpenter by trade, <laughs> but he didn't ever make a lot of money. All he could do was make chests and cupboards, but oh, he was good with carving things. People would often commission him to carve a figure or an animal or something like that. And 30 years before this story starts, he decided that he was going to make a nativity scene. He started out small, he spared no expense, got the best wood, and he started carving and whittling until he had the baby Jesus in the manger and Mary and Joseph. Then the next year, he added the shepherds. The year after that, it was the angels and then the wise men. And even after that, he started having the townspeople, the book butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. I mean, he had all these details, mountains and Bethlehem buildings and anything you could imagine. Well, <laughs> by year 28, he had so much that it took up his whole house. And people started noticing it and people wanted to come see it. He had two visitors that one year, and basically they became very significant part of their lives. The first was Frau Schneider. She was a widow woman who lived, oh, around 15 minutes away. She was his nearest neighbor. Her husband had died, and she was having to raise five children by herself. Well, she came bringing the children. Oh, immediately the forest fair stiffened up. Oh, I hope they don't break anything. I hope they don't touch anything, he said to himself. <laughs> he needn't have worried. She told those children, you look, but you don't touch. And they were very well behaved. Well, he sighed a sigh of relief when they left. But then Frau Schneider started coming over and visiting. Oh, she'd bring him a steaming hot bowl of soup sometimes, or stew, whatever it was she was feeding her children. <laughs> he especially liked it, though, when she brought these cakes and pastries. He had a real sweet tooth. It was a beautiful friendship. Frau Schneider would come over, and she could talk all about what her kids had done, what they'd said, about what her life was like. 
and he was a man of few words, so he would nod his head and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he enjoyed watching the children, and sometimes they even asked to sit on his lap, which was something totally new, but he liked it. Now, the other visitor that came was a man by the name of Professor Hermann. He was a university instructor in Innsbruck, and he collected all things Tyrolean. Tyrol is a section of Austria. He had dances and songs and music and personal stories and folk tales and superstitions and all kinds of crafts. When he heard about that crash, he wanted to see it. He came and it was more magnificent than he could have ever imagined. Impulsively, he just said, Herr Pear, I'd like to buy your crash for 600 guilders. Oh, 600 guilders, that's a small fortune, but I can't sell it, nine, nine, no, it's too much work, I cannot sell it. <laughs> I understand, said the professor. And so he said, uh, but I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm gonna write down on this paper the instructions so you can get to my house if you ever change your mind. Don't go should, said the forest bear. And Professor Hermann left. Now, that particular year, he decided to make a Christmas tree for the Schneider family. Oh, he took so much time with all the details. He brought bright colored beads that he pasted on so they'd look like ornaments and even fashioned some little candles. He stood back when it was finished and he was satisfied. So on December 24th, he got everything ready. He bundled up because it was cold and snowy out there. And he took that Christmas tree to the Schneider house. He'd never been there before. He was a little nervous, but he knocked on the door. Now, the widow woman, Frau Schneider, opened the door, but she didn't have a smile on her face, not the way she usually did when she saw him. And in fact, it even looked her eyes were all red. It looked like maybe she'd been crying. And, and he presented her with the Christmas tree. And she said, oh, hair, hair, it's beautiful. I've never had a gift like this before. I'll take it with me wherever I go. Huh. You're not planning on moving, are you? He asked. I don't want to, <laughs> but, but I owe my creditor 600 guilders, and there's no way I can come up with that money. I'm going to have to farm my children out to different families, and then I'll have to take a job as a servant. I can't even bear the thought of, of being separated from my children. <laughs> The forest for bear did not do emotion very well. He didn't know what to do or what to say. So finally, he tentatively patted her on the shoulder and said, I'm sure everything will work out okay. It's getting dark. I have to go. Auf Wiedersehen. Goodbye. Well, he walked home with a heavy heart, worried about his neighbor and her children. That night, it was Christmas Eve, and he did what he always did. He sat in front of the baby Jesus and Mary and Joseph. He lit candles and put them all around. And then he bowed his head, and he prayed. And meanwhile, his heart said to him, Blasi, you have to do something for your neighbor. But his head said, no, I do not have that kind of money. And his heart said, but, but Blasi, you could sell that 
You could sell that nativity scene for 600 guilders. His head said, no, no, I've put too much time and too much effort and too much money. No, I cannot do that. But his heart said, she's your friend. You've got to do something. And his head said, well, I will have to think about it for a few days. And so for the next few days, he did think about it. And he decided he had to do the right thing. So he looked at his nativity scene and wiped away a tear or two. He bundled up and he walked all the way to Innsbruck. He found the professor's house, knocked on the door, wiping away a tear or two. The professor came to the door and said, Herr Pear, what a pleasant surprise. Come in, come in. What can I do for you? I have come to sell my nativity scene for 600 guilders. Hmm. All of a sudden, the professor became quite businesslike. He said, well, after I made you that offer, I got to thinking about it. I think I can only pay you 300 guilders. <laughs> 300 guilders, nine, no, no. I have to have 600 guilders. The man, the forest bear was trembling and the tears were starting to come down his cheeks. And so professor noticed it and said, why did you decide to change? And the forest fair told him all about what had happened. And Professor Iman said, hmm, I think I can sell. I think I'll buy it from you for 600 guilders. Now you just stay seated. I'm going to go in the other room to get the money and then I'll be back. Well, the forest fair waited for what seemed like the longest time. And then Professor Hermann came back. In one hand, he had the money. In the other hand, <clears throat> he had a paper. The professor said, I got to thinking, <laughs> I don't think I really have enough room here to have all of your figures of the nativity scene. So I drew up a contract. I hope it's acceptable. Upon your death, you put in your will or make it known that I will then take possession. But until then, you keep the nativity. Is that acceptable? Yeah, 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 said the forest bear. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he couldn't believe his ears. And so he got up and he had to get home before dark. Well, actually, he had to get to Frau, Frau Schneider's house right away. Oh, he had a spring in his step and joy in his heart. He went to the door, he knocked. She opened up the door. He went right in with the money and put it right there on the table. Now you can pay your creditors, he said. Oh, Blasi, how? Where did you come up with this money? I can't take it. Oh, I insist that you take it. And then he told her the story. Oh, her joy was just overwhelming. She came and she threw her arms around his neck and, and the children, they all came up. Everybody had a group hug and uh, he turned bright red. He'd never had that kind of affection before, but it warmed his heart. He liked it. <laughs> well, they said, I have to be getting home before dark. And I'll see her same. Goodbye. And off he went. Oh, he couldn't help but think <laughs> that uh, he'd never had such a meaningful Christmas. It was the best one ever. And on his way home, he found himself just singing at the top of his lungs in the middle of the woods, the song he hadn't sung since he was just a little boy. The song was Silent Night.
Well, since we're telling stories about the holidays, I thought I would share the story of how Tony Beaver got his men home for Christmas. You never heard of Tony Beaver before? Well, that's probably because you weren't alive 150 years ago. But if you had lived in the earliest days of the statehood of West Virginia, you might have heard all kinds of stories about Tony Beaver. Tony Beaver was the most famous, well-known woodsman in all of West Virginia. There are all kinds of stories told about the incredible things he had done. But as the timbering industry died out, so did the stories of Tony Beaver. So let me tell you. I guess it would help to start back when Ma and Pa Beaver first came to West Virginia. Now, of course, it was still the state of Virginia back then. And they drove their wagon up and over those Appalachian mountains looking for some place to settle, to raise their children. Now, Ma Beaver, she was big. She was a head over seven feet tall. And Pa Beaver was even bigger. He was almost eight feet tall when he stood all the way up. But that wasn't often, as he said, What's the use of straightening your back all the way up when you're just going to have to hunch back over again? Uh, it's a waste of energy. Well, all that saved energy went into their children. They had three little beavers with them. There was Molly Beaver, Tony Beaver, and Betsy Beaver. And those little beavers, they were growing, growing, growing to be just like their parents. And the one that grew the biggest was Tony. Why, he grew so fast, you could watch him grow. They get him a new pair of trousers, and as soon as he put them on, you could see the leg of his pant rising up his shin like that. Why, when Mother Beaver had made him a new coat for winter, as soon as he put it on, it was coming up his wrist like this. She'd have to take off the sleeves, measure them out, make new sleeves, and as soon as she'd sewn them back on, already too small. Tony Beaver got so big that they said he could hug one of those big evergreen trees. He was so big, he could jump from mountain to mountain. And he was a good woodsman, too. They said that Tony Beaver could shoot, pow, a shooting star right in the center as it shot across the sky. Well, as Tony and the other beavers got bigger, he and his sister Molly decided to go and explore the woods there in Appalachia. And Tony, he had such good eyesight, he could see a mile away. And he said, look, sister, I see what looks to be a little tiny river there in the distance. Where, she said, I don't see a thing. He said, it's over there. Where, she said, he said, well, it must be a mile away because that's as far as I can see, and it's right at the edge of what I can see. Come on! And they jumped from mountain to mountain to mountain till they were right there over it. See, he said, it's the start of a little river right here. They got down on the ground and looked. And Molly said, well, that ain't nothing but some dew that hasn't risen up from the sun yet. And Tony said, no, I think it's a river. And as they watched that water, they heard the water say, Follow me, follow me. It was a babbling brook. And they followed that little brook into the woods. And it grew a little bit wider. Till it was as wide as my pinky finger. Follow me. It grew wider until it was so wide that I could barely jump across it. And it turned and snaked like this, growing wider and wider, till soon that river was so wide that Tony couldn't even jump across it or see the other side, which must have been about a mile away. It went up and up and up into the mountains and then cascaded over the side in the biggest, most beautiful waterfall you ever saw. And there was such a nice, gentle place down in that low ground where the water landed that Tony and Molly decided 
this is where we'll start our town. They were seeking their fortune after all. They decided to call it Eel Landing after that Eel River. Well, that's what they called the river because it twisted and turned so much it was like an eel made out of water. I guess this is where we'll stay, they said. But the river said, follow me. So they kept following it. I want to see where this goes, said Tony. I want to see where it goes, too, said Molly. I go nowhere, said the river. And sure enough, as they followed it, and it narrowed and narrowed and narrowed and narrowed, it almost disappeared. But they were right back where they had started. Tony said, can you imagine that? A river that goes nowhere and starts nowhere and talks? It has no beginning and no end? Sounds like the right kind of place for us. Well, they set up town there at Eel Landing. The Eel River came through, and there was so much good old-growth forest there that Tony decided to set up a company as a lumberman. And soon, people moved into that town, families, individuals, and Molly, she became the townkeeper, making sure everything was in order. And Tony, he gathered up some men, started that company, and they'd go up and up into those mountains, cutting down that lumber. It was a good business, too, because way back in those days, well, they needed wood for the railroads. They needed wood for all the fancy decorations and the big buildings they were building up in those cities up north. They needed it for furniture. and That's how the next part of Tony's life started. Now, I could tell you all kinds of stories about Tony, about... How that one time he was wrestling a mountain panther and its whiskers brushed against his teeth and he invented the first toothbrush. I can tell you about that time that he accidentally poured all that maple syrup into the water of the river on a real hot day and he invented peanut brittle for the first time. I can tell you about the time that it rained fur or the time that it snowed pancakes, but the story I really want to tell you, now that you know a little bit about Tony, is the time that Tony Beaver got his men home for Christmas. Now, Tony and his men were way up high in the mountains. They were cutting down trees. and you got to get into your mind the size of these trees back in those days. Think of the biggest tree you ever saw in your life and triple its size. These trees were even bigger than that. They had the kind of saw that men would get on each end of it. And they would saw through those trees. They had a special kind of saw that made a big horseshoe shape. A handle on this end and this end so one man could cut down a tree all by himself. Well, that team of men, they were so good at working and so focused on what they were doing that they worked day after day after day and didn't realize when the end of the autumn got near. And all of a sudden, it began to snow. They were working so hard that they didn't notice as the snow began to pile up, up, up. And it was so tall that the men, when they saw how much snow there was and realized what they were doing, oh no, we don't think we'll be able to get down the mountain to get back to town. We might not even be able to get all these logs down the river. What are we going to do? They went to Tony, and Tony said, I like an adventure, and I like a challenge. Men, come on over here. He took a big shovel and cleared away a little bit of snow, and under that snow he found a big, shiny boulder. Tony was so big, he picked it right up like this and began squeezing it against his ribs like this. And as he did, he pulled one end of the boulder out like this uh, in a long, thin strand. He pulled like this. Now take it and wrap it around that log over there. And it took all the rest of the men to pull, and they wrapped it around the end of the log. Now turn it around, and they began turning that log like this as Tony kept squeezing and pulling. And of course, he was drawing out a wire from a boulder. And once he had drawn it into a wire, well, that log was wrapped like a giant spool. 
Now, men, take that wire, and we want to twist it around the edge of this first log here, and twist it around, and then around the end of the other log like this, and cut it. Now go to the end of that log, wrap it around again, give it a twist, wrap it around the next log like that, so that the ends are tied together with that wire. Do just like I said and keep turning the wire around each end of the logs, two at a time, two at a time, two at a time. Now, once they had done all that, Tony said, all right, you, you, and you, and you, and you, every one of you, get on your own log, set up of it a straddle like this. And they got them with their legs over the edge of the logs like this, one man per tree. And Tony got up to the very first one. He set his shoulder against the butt face of that log, leaned into it. Here we go, he said. And he pushed like that ah, into that first log, took off, just slowly slipping down that mountainside over top of the snow. Tony was running alongside as he pushed, and he leapt up on top of that log and straddled it too. woo he said. Here we go, boys. Well... As Tony's log went, it was wrapped with wire to the next one, which straightened out like that and started coming down that mountain. The next one straightened out, the next one, the next. There was a man on each one of them until it was a big train of logs sliding down that snowy mountainside, getting faster and faster as they went. Tony, they said, slow it down, Tony, make it stop. But Tony was having a ball. Here we go. Woohoo! He was using his shovel as a rudder to steer like this, around this way, that way. What a great big snow skid. Hold on tight, fellas, he said. I think I see a big bump. And there was a big mound of snow like this, and Tony steered his lead log up onto it. And all the rest of that train just went up into the air like that. They were going so fast that they flew so high into the air that one man's jacket buttons froze like that and popped right off of his jacket. And they were so high up in the air that those buttons flew, got stuck right in outer space where they still shine as stars to this day. Kaboom! Those logs landed on the ground and now they were down at the bottom of the mountain and were skidding across that frozen eel river. As they screeched across it, coming to a halt, well, it shaved a whole bunch of that ice out into a big spray like this in every direction. Little kids from the town came running with their tongues out to get a taste of that shaved ice. Well, when they stopped, the men said, Tony, let's not ever do that again. <laughs> Tony looked around and saw that the whole town was decorated. Well, fellas, he said, did any of you know it was Christmas Eve? I sure didn't. Let's go get cleaned up. They all ran into their homes and sharpened their axes and used them to shave off the beards that they'd grown since they'd been up there working among all the trees. Wanted to look presentable, of course. And they came into town, and there in the town square was an evergreen tree 200 feet tall. And all the townspeople came out with hand-dipped candles. They lit those candles and set them all up into the tree to help Molly had to get onto Tony's back, on his shoulders, to get up to the very top, of course. And once that tree was lit up with all those homemade candles, why, it was like there was a second moon shining in the night sky. Everybody had a big feast. And they danced and sang songs. And well, then it was time for Molly's famous plum pudding. It was so big, it took 50 people to carry it out to the town square. And they covered it with brandy and set it on fire. <laughs> A blaze that went 50 feet up in the air. Mm, it filled everyone's bellies. And next, well, Betsy Beaver had made one of her famous pumpkin pies. She made out of one pumpkin, a pumpkin that was so big that once they carved it open and scooped out the insides, well, all the kids in the town climbed inside, and they couldn't wait for springtime when the Eel River would thaw and they could use it as a boat. Christmas. They were celebrating Christmas in the old-fashioned way. 
candles on the tree, a big feast, good desserts, singing and dancing, and of course, most importantly, people being together and sharing love which is why it's so important now that you've heard the story about how Tony Beaver got his man home in time for Christmas. Every year on January 6th, the people of Italy celebrate Three Kings Day it's a national holiday and it marks the end of the Christmas season, the 12 days of Christmas. So I'm going to tell you a story from Italy and it has to do with this old lady called La Vifana. She plays a big role in the festivities. But first to get us in the mood, I'm going to have Otto play the accordion again, this time, O Sole Mio. Long ago, about the time of the first Christmas, there lived an old lady by the name of La Bifana. <laughs> oh, she lived in a, a, a tiny little house in a small village in Italy. And she lived by herself and she did not have many visitors. I rather suspect it's because she could be downright canned tankers. The children, oh, the children were afraid of her. They could sense that she didn't like children, and so they avoided her. <laughs> and all that changed, though, in a few years. Now, she never had many visitors, as I said, so what did she do? She cleaned her house all day long. She dusted, 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 scrub, 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 swept, swept, swept. And the only time she got out during the daytime was to go out the front door and just sweep her walkway clean. And then she'd come back in and start all over again. Now at night, it was a little different story. She had a magical broom. She went outside the door, she climbed on top of her broomstick, and whoom, away she went, flying this place and that place and this place and that place. Oh, and then when she was really tired, she'd go back to the house and get ready for bed. She always locked the door, closed the shutters, except in the area where she slept. She left those shutters open just a little bit so she could have some fresh air. One night, she was sound asleep but she awakened, something wasn't quite right. Oh, she said, I wonder where that light's coming from. I've never had that much light in my house before. Huh. I have to go check, it seems to be coming from outside. So she walked over to the window and she looked out. Hmm. I never noticed that star before, she said. It shines real bright. I can't sleep with that much light in my room. I guess I'll have to shut the shutters. And with that, she went back to bed. So the next morning she got up and she went through the routine. She dusted, 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 scrubbed, 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 swept, swept, swept. And she went to open the front door to go out and sweep the walkway. But she stopped and stared. <laughs> Why there, on her road was a long, long procession. I mean, there were three men mounted on camels 
and then just common ordinary, maybe partly servants or partly townspeople. She wasn't really sure. Hmm. She said, well, I'm going to go inside. I don't want to have to talk to anybody. So she went inside her house, <laughs> but she was curious. So she peeked out the window and there she saw as they got closer that the three men mounted on the camels were dressed in the most elegant robes you'd ever seen. And on top of their heads, there were crowns. Hmm, she said, they must be kings. Well, I'm just going to stay in here. Hope they don't know that I'm in here. <laughs> it's not the way it turned out because when the three kings got right in front of her house, they got off the camel and they came to the front door. Oh no, oh no, what should I do? What should I do, she thought. I hope they aren't gonna to plan to hurt me. Well, then one of the kings knocked on the door and spoke up, Signora, I know you're in there. We saw you from afar. And the second one said, we mean you no harm. We just want directions to Bethlehem. And the third one said, <clears throat> we won't hurt you, please let us in. And so she opened the door and thought, well, I guess I have to be hospitable. So she invited them to sit down and she would make something to eat and something to drink. And while she was doing those things, the kings explained. One of them said, <laughs> Well, for hundreds of years, the prophets have been foretelling the birth of a baby, a baby born in Bethlehem, the son of God, born of a woman. The other one said, we need to know if you can direct us to Bethlehem. Oh, no, 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 she said, no, 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 I couldn't do that. I have too many chores. I have to clean my house. And besides, I don't know how to get to Bethlehem. And the third one said, well, hmm. And then she said, oh, I know. If you go down the road, the same direction that you were coming before, the lady in the next house on the right-hand side, she probably could tell you how to get there. And the third one said, Signora, why don't you plan to come with us? Wouldn't you like to see the divine child? Oh, no, no, she said. I couldn't do that. I mean, I have to clean my house. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> but you go ahead. I hope you find it. And they said, well, <laughs> follow that bright star. That's what we did till we got a little bit lost. <sighs> well, grazie. Thanks. Arrivederci. And off they went. Whew. She sighed a sigh of relief. But then she got to thinking, God sent his only son to the earth born as a baby. Hey, God must love us a lot. I should have gone with them. I would like to have seen the divine child, but I don't have a gift. I know, I'll make some bread and some cookies and cakes, and I'll take that to the baby Jesus. So she went bustling around the house, making all those things, packed them into a basket when they were cool. She took her broom, she might help the mother, the new mother sweep the floor, and off she went. She went to the neighbor and got the directions, <laughs> but she was old, and her mind didn't work that well. It didn't remember things that well. So she got a little lost, but then at night she was able to jump on her broomstick and follow that star. And she kept looking everywhere, <laughs> but she couldn't find the baby Jesus. And do you know, for more than 2,000 years, she has been searching for the Holy Child and never found them. But she's never given up the search. Every January 5th, Epiphany Eve, at night, she can somehow sense which houses have children. She'll jump on her broomstick and she'll fly and then she'll get on the rooftop 
and down the chimney she'll go. <laughs> the children look forward to her visit every year. They put out their shoes and she fills them with toys and cookies and candies, all sorts of good things. <laughs> and if she's lucky, the family will leave her a little glass of wine and maybe some nuts or snacks. She's very careful though only to sip a little bit of the wine because she has to fly straight. And then she goes to the next house and the next and the next. And the children, <laughs> they know the story. And in a way they're hoping she could find the baby Jesus. But then maybe, maybe she wouldn't come and visit them bringing all kinds of gifts. Oh, and that would certainly be very sad. <laughs> I want to tell a few stories about different traditions people have in different parts of Appalachia. So I'm sure you all have heard of Christmas, but I wonder how many of you have heard of Old Christmas, or maybe if any of you have celebrated Old Christmas. Long ago, many, many, many years ago, there was a different calendar that people used. It was called the Julian calendar, and it was proposed by Julius as an adaptation of the Roman calendar, which was even older. There were some problems with the Julian calendar, and by the time that Pope Gregory XIII came along, he proposed a new calendar, which came to be known as the Gregorian calendar. And that's the calendar most of us use today. Well, it took people across Europe a long time to adopt the new calendar. And even when they did, some people still wanted to celebrate Christmas on the day that they had during the Julian calendar. So they kept celebrating it on that date. And that's where we get the name Old Christmas. Today, Old Christmas is 13 days after present Christmas. It changes dates every so often because the Julian calendar and the Gregorian calendar have differences in them. So right now, 13 days after Christmas, you can celebrate Old Christmas. And people throughout Appalachia have a number of different ways that they celebrate Old Christmas. Some folks go and cut evergreen branches and bring them into their house and set them around using them as decoration, which of course smells great. But it's also a reminder that springtime and green things and new life are coming soon and that the winter won't last forever. Some people celebrate old Christmas by putting on plays or singing certain carols. Some people say that old Christmas is different than Christmas because on Christmas you put the kids to bed early. You want to go to bed so that Santa can come visit you overnight. And of course, bring presents for all the good kids and lumps of coal for the naughty kids. But on old Christmas, you don't want to go to bed. If you can stay up as late as you can and make it to midnight, some folks say that at the stroke of midnight, you can hear the animals talk. Now, I won't tell you what they say. You have to wait till old Christmas and see if you can stay up late enough to hear for yourself. Some folks will take a broom and sweep out their house, sweeping out all of the old stuff and old thoughts from the previous year, making way for a clean house, making way for a new year, 
making way for a better year. But my favorite tradition for old Christmas is something I learned from another storyteller named Elizabeth Ellis, who's from East Kentucky and Eastern Tennessee. Elizabeth taught me to celebrate old Christmas by baking a fortune-telling old Christmas cake. It's gingerbread flavor. And just before you put it into the oven, you take some tokens, and you put those tokens down into the batter so the cake bakes up around them. Then when the cake's ready and everybody gets a piece, you eat real careful, make sure you don't swallow a token. But if you get a token in your piece, well, it tells your fortune for the year. If you get a thimble, then you will have a year of work. If you get a ring, well, you'll have a year of romance. If you get the diaper pin, there's going to be an addition to your family. There's a piece of silver money in there, and if you get that, well, you're going to have a year of wealth. And there's also a nail. You have to eat very carefully. If you get the nail in your piece of cake, well, it means you're going to have a year of travel. You might wonder how those two are related, but remember, this is an old tradition. So this nail is from a horseshoe, and that's why it's a year of travel. Some of the newer tokens that go in include a key for a year of wisdom and a jack for a year of play. Now, since we've been doing it in my household, this old Christmas fortune-telling cake has predicted among friends and relatives one engagement and two babies. Another tradition that some folks in Appalachia celebrate is the tradition of a visit from the old Belschnickel. The Belschnickel is an old, rough, wild man. He's tall, and he wears a coat made of burlap or some heavy fabric lined with fur. The Belschnickel might have a hat with fur also and a big beard. And over his shoulder, the Belschnickel comes with a pack that has switches and little treats, maybe some little toys or fruits or nuts. And the Belschnickel goes from house to house, knocking on the door. The Belschnickel's here! The Belschnickel's here! Everyone put on your disguises! People put on their disguises, and when the Belschnickel comes in, the Belschnickel has to guess who each person is under their disguises. If the Belschnickel's right, that person has to do a little trick. Maybe recite a poem or tell a joke or do a little dance. Maybe a cartwheel. But if the Belschnickel is wrong, he reaches into his pack and pulls out a treat to give to that person. Once there's been a guest for every person at that house, the Belschnickel leaves and everybody follows, and the Belschnickel goes to the next house and guesses for all the people there, and then they join the party. And the next house, they join, and the next, until everyone in the whole town is together. And some folks would say that once a big group was together and there were a few houses left, some folks would sneak out of the back of the group and run in secret up to the next house, put on a different disguise to fool the Belschnickel. And of course, it's all about having fun and having some tricks and sharing some treats. But some folks celebrate the Belschnickel's visit a little bit differently. They say, watch out or the old Belschnickel will get you. When the Belschnickel visits, he might reach into his pack and reach out some goodies. But don't go reaching for him, because if you do, wah, the Belschnickel will whip you with one of those switches. You gotta wait till the Belschnickel asks, who wants a treat tonight? Or wait till the Belschnickel casts all those goodies down onto the floor, and then you can go and get them. Well, when I was growing up, we never had the Belschnickel. We also uh, celebrated 
a little bit of a different observa- observance, a different tradition that wasn't old Christmas and it wasn't Christmas. And it usually happened before both of those. It was Hanukkah. And that's because part of my family is Jewish. There are a number of Jewish Appalachians. And when I was a kid, we would celebrate Hanukkah at my great-grandparents' house, just like all the other Jewish holidays. Going into their house over to this side was a big living room and just past it a big dining room, and tables would go from one end of the house all the way to the other through those rooms. The adults ate at the tables in the dining room, and the children ate at the tables in the living room. And in my family, children was pretty much anyone under the age of 55. When you went into the house, the first thing you went into was a hall. Not a hallway, a hall. It had a formal staircase that went up to the second floor. There was a creepy old grandfather clock. A table, specifically for a telephone. And also there was a coat tree for four coats. And there were dozens of us, so one of the things we looked for every year was to see whose coat was gonna be the one that caused the tree to fall over. Well, one year at Hanukkah, I was standing in the hall looking at all the presents that lined the floor next to the stairway when my great-grandmother came around the corner. It was her house. She shuffled everywhere she went but she really looked like she was floating because she wore wide-legged polyester pants. She float shuffled around the corner and she walked with her elbows out like this behind her, pointing, triangles, almost like her arms had been put on the wrong way. She came around and... My great-grandmother had been born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She was the daughter of Lithuanian immigrants. And when she was a very little girl, her mother died. And her dad, who was a tailor, remarried. Her stepmother was just like out of an old fairy tale. Wicked. Mean to her. And shared her love with her own daughter and not her stepdaughter. And so my great-grandmother ran away from home. By different stories that were passed down to me in the family, she might have been 17 or 16 or even 13 when she ran away from Philadelphia in the 1920s across the country and ended up in eastern Kentucky. Why eastern Kentucky? Because her older sister was already there. She met a man from one of the little Jewish communities that dotted the Ohio River at that time, a man named Ted, and they started their family. A family that, after several generations, would include me. So I was standing there as she came around the corner and shuffled past all those presents. She began to ascend the staircase, left foot, lift, right foot, left foot, Lift, right foot. And I saw her feet slowly, slowly go up in front of my eyes. It was an elegant climb. And her beautiful hands, she had very pretty hands, just grazed against the banister as she went. And as she did, I saw that one of her shoes had a heel that was taller. In fact, the whole sole of her shoe was taller than the other one. She did whatever upstairs, and I didn't know because no children were ever allowed up there. But when she came back down, I said, Mo, that's what we called her, Mo, Mo, what happened to your foot? She sat down on the fifth step and patted the step next to her. I sat down and she said, A long time ago, I was in a car accident. A car accident. Did you die? (laughs) No. (laughs) Almost. 
But I got back up and I kept going. Just then the front door opened and some more cousins came in. A big paper dreidel decoration spun around in the air and they took off their coats and set them on the coat tree, which started to tip over. Oh, it hit against the banister and knocked down on the floor and the coats spread out everywhere and people laughed. This happens every year. And they put them back on and picked it back up. On the steps, my great-grandmother looked down and said, Do you know why we celebrate Hanukkah? Mm, to eat latkes? <laughs> it's a long story. Lots of details. I don't even know all of it. I don't have time to tell you all the parts I know, but it was a long time ago. And the Syrians, one of the Jews, to worship different gods. They wanted the Jews to worship different idols, but the Jews just wanted to worship God the way they knew how to do and follow the laws that they had. And so there was a big battle between them, a battle that took place in a number of places with a number of different factions and went on for a long time. Well, when there was just one Jewish holdout left, an old, old priest who was among them. He was very old. Older than you? <laughs> Older than me. An old priest named Matit Yahu led, led a, a faction against the Syrians and started to win. And then his sons took over. And one of his sons was named Judah. And they called Judah Maccabee. And everyone that followed him was called a Maccabee. Maccabee meaning, who is like you, God? And God was with them. And they won. They fought and they won and they fought and they won. And when they regained the temple in Jerusalem, well, the menorah had been stolen. And so they made a new one out of a different metal, and they had only enough oil to burn in the menorah for one night. But a miracle happened. The oil burned for eight nights. Hanukkah is a holiday about survival. Now, get up. Let's go eat. We went down to the table, and when I was a kid, Hanukkah was a feast like other ho Jewish holidays. In our house, we had matzo ball soup, and we had applesauce, and we had harosis with matzah and horseradish and gefilte fish, and we had brisket, which was always a little dry, and we had chicken, which was always a little greasy, and... We had hollow with honey. And after all that, we had potato latkes. And once all that was over and everything was put away, the chairs and the tables were cleaned up and put away, and we had presents, and then it was time to play dreidel. We'd spin the dreidel and see which one landed. And pick it up and spin the dreidel and see which one landed. And pick it up and spin. Pick it up and spin. And the kids, we would spin around in circles just like the dreidel. Fall over and get back up. Fall over and get back up. Celebrating Hanukkah, a holiday of survival.